It's eventually going to be posted on the Mille Lacs Lake webpage. And that's so that uh, any of our MILFAC members that um, weren't able to join us today, um, they can they can see what we talked about and also just for the general public. So one of the things that we had in our Mille Lacs Lake management plan that we finished here just a few, well, a couple of months ago now, I guess, is that um, we felt it was important to uh, increase the type of information that we were providing to, to the public. And so this is gonna be part of that as well. So anybody who wants to um, watch one of these, you know, Fisheries 101 sessions can just uh, boot it up on their computer and and listen through. So with that, then um, I guess I'd like to get going. Uh, so first of all, thanks guys for uh, for joining us on a Sunday evening. Well, it might not be the greatest night, but I don't know if any of them are any better than anything else. So I figured Sunday was a night that at least people weren't going to be working or anything. So with that, I guess I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Tom Heinrich. I'm the Fisheries Area Supervisor down on Mille Lacs. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been here now since uh, January of 2018. And uh, prior to that time, I spent 27 years up on Lake of the Woods as a large lake specialist up there. So we've got a couple of DNR folks with us too. Christy Coons has been talking. Um, can you introduce yourself, Christy? Sure. So I'm Christy Coons. I am the Office Administrative Specialist for um, Mille Lacs Lake and then also for the Aiken Fisheries Office. And I have been here with the DNR for three and a half years. Prior to that, I worked for Aiken County in their zoning office. And I'm originally from this area. So, yep. OK, and then we've got uh, Dan Shermerhorn is with us also from the DNR. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Dan. I am the assistant supervisor in the area office there. Um, I just joined the Mille Lacs crew in November. Prior to that, I was working up in International Falls uh, on Rainy and Cabotogama. Okay. Thanks, Dan. And let's see, who do we have next? Next on my list here is Jody Kroll. Hi, I am Jody Cole. I am with the Malaysia Lake Area Tourism Council, and I've been up here for a lot of years. My whole life. Ten years here, thirty years in Lake Lake. Okay. And then uh, let's see. Next on my list is Steve Heiskerry. Hi, this is Steve. Um, I'm a summer resident on, on Malax, but right at the moment I'm down in. Um, on the coast of Texas. Okay, thanks, Steve. And then I've got Melissa, and I think your last name is LeBeau, right? Correct. I'm a summer resident as well up there in the Garrison area and live down here in the cities and been up there all my life and almost every weekend, sometimes even in the winter. So just got back from Otter Tail about half an hour ago. So uh, no uh, sunshine and rainbows for me up here. <laughs> and then our last MILFAC member is Larry Dollar. Hello, I'm Larry Daler, and uh, I've spent uh, about the last 50 years fishing on Mille Lacs, sir. And uh, next week, about this time, I'm going to be in Phoenix for a week. And hopefully, when I come back, I might even be spring here. <laughs> yep, we can be hopeful. Yes. OK, so with that, I'd like to start my slideshow. And that should do it. OK, is it visible to everyone now? Yep. OK, yes, cool. You can see it, Tom. OK, so what we call this, um, you know, I, I was involved when the um, when the Lake of the Woods um, um, input group got started, which had a similar function to what Milfac has down here. 
And what we try to do is we try to get people up to speed on um, uh, some of the biology, some of the things that we know about the lake, and then also uh, the sampling techniques that we use in order to you know, collect the data that we feel is important to understand what's going on with the lake. And um, up there we called it Fisheries 101, and I thought that was kind of a cool, cool name to use, and so I just continued that here. So the gal holding the wall, I hear that happens to be a picture of my daughter when she was in high school. And um, I took her out electro fishing on the Rainy River. And uh, of course the Rainy River's got a pretty good walleye population. And she always liked to come along with me on, um, on some of our work trips, especially the fun ones. So just to kind of back up a little bit here, um, the mission of the Minnesota DNR is to work with Minnesotans to conserve and manage the state's uh, natural resources. And so that's what we're doing with you guys. You know, you're kind of one of our sounding boards. You're here to provide us with some input on, um, you know, things we ought to consider when we make decisions. But I mean, ultimately, what you guys have to realize is that uh, you're an advisory group and uh, you're not making the decisions. We're not expecting that of you guys, but uh, we are looking for input on, you know, potential issues that the decisions that we make as an agency uh, can create to our users. And um, so some of the other issues uh, sort or some of the other parts of our mission statement are that, um, you know, we're supposed to provide outdoor recreational opportunities and also provide for the commercial uses of our natural resources. And, you know, in the case of fishing on Mille Lacs, it's going to be primarily the resorts. Um, and uh, the type, you know, what one of the things that really guides the decisions that we make is that, you um, any, any of the decisions that we have to do have to be sustainable, you know, in, in how they ultimately impact our natural resources. So tonight, what we're going to focus on is uh, productivity on the lake. And, um, and that's something that's actually changed through time. And I think what I'd like to show you guys is kind of go through the process of how we determined or give you an idea of what we're looking at when we're talking about productivity and uh, and then also give you some background on what's changed on the lake in general. One of the things that I found um, when I'm trying to explain a concept like productivity is I like to kind of first of all put it in the context of um, a terrestrial environment. So in this case it's just a farm field and you can see that these two are, are some very different farm fields even though they both got corn growing on them. The field on the left appears to be very productive. It's got absolutely everything needed to, to produce a good crop of corn, right? The field on the right, it, uh, it appears to me that what's going on here is that uh, a drought has hit this field and the corn just isn't growing. It may very well be a very productive field um, when it's got water in it, but it's, it's really important that probably with, with just that one single missing ingredient, that, that field cannot be productive. And that's kind of what we're going to go through now with, um, you know, with the lake. So now skipping over to a productive and then relatively unproductive uh, water body, we can see that um, on the left, we've got a water body that's very green. There's a lot of algae growing in it. Um, and on the right, we've got a really beautiful, pristine water body. The water is very, very clear, uh, but it's really not very productive. And... Um, you know, and, and that's kind of one of the one of the things that I have a hard time getting across to people is that I mean, when you when you look at these different lakes, the one on the left just looks kind of ugly, right? You know, but uh, but it's really not particularly productive. The one on the uh, on the right could very well be, you know, I'm guessing this is probably Lake Superior. I just swiped these photos off the internet. Probably Lake Superior just because you can't see the other shoreline, but it's very very clear, and um, and you know for the amount of stuff that that lake can produce per acre, it's uh, it's it's much lower than what the lake on the uh, on the left can do. But because it's got a very different level of productivity, it can also support a very different fish community. So the lake on the left, you know, we're probably looking at bass, probably some walleye in there, you know, depending on exactly how productive it is. Whereas the lake on the right is going to be much more focused on uh, producing things like trout, cold water species if it's deep enough. Um, and and not nearly as many pounds of uh, of fish as being able to produce in that lake on the right. Um, an important concept that we have to get across here too is that productivity isn't just fish biomass. It's like all the things that grow in the water. 
So the algae is part of productivity, the zooplankton, you know, the little animals that are drifting around in the water column, that's part of productivity. The crayfish on the bottom, the fish, everything, you have to sum all that up in order to um, kind of gauge what, you know, what the overall productivity is. On Mille Lacs, we're particularly interested in how, uh, how many pounds of walleye that this lake can actually produce. That's a very narrow focus to our productivity. So, kind of give you some of the background on, on what Mille Lacs Lake um, has going for it. Um, the first thing that I noticed when I started moving, when I moved down here, you know, I kind of looked around and see what's what's going on in this lake, right? And uh, one of the things that I, you know, that I noticed was that the soils in the Mille Lacs Lake watershed are really not very productive. Uh, this is an area that's got a lot of glacial till in it, and so there's a lot of sand and gravel in the, in the soils here. And if you think about it, um, in, in terms of what the land uses are around the lake, only about 17% of the whole watershed is in agricultural production. And that should give you a hint that uh, the soils around here aren't very productive. Um, because if it's like the rest of Minnesota, wherever you had very productive soils, the trees basically got slicked off and, uh, and those areas were turned into farmland. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happened historically around here, you know, where there were some areas where the trees had gotten slicked off, but just because, um, it, you know, it's very difficult to farm unproductive soils, you know, the, the ultimately those soils just went back in, or those farms went, went back into trees. Now, with, um, with, with freshwater systems, just like when that, with that picture that I showed you earlier, uh, where there was only one missing ingredient, you know, in terms of that one cornfield and that was water, uh, it, it, yeah, it was water in that particular cornfield. The nutrient in, in freshwater lakes that's almost always the limiting nutrient is phosphorus. And phosphorus gets added to the water through a variety of, um, through a variety of means, you know, it, it gets added through erosion. And then there's, there's a bunch of land, um, human uses that can, that can add um, phosphorus to water. Um, agriculture, um, something, um, you know, with the, uh, with either uh, runoff from manure or um, erosion, agricultural erosion, also um, over application of fertilizers um, that'll ultimately wash down into water bodies. Uh, lawns and gardens, if there's a lot of lawns and gardens around your lake, you know, uh, people like to um, fertilize their lawn so they've got a nice green lawn. A lot of that fertilizer can end up in the lake. Golf courses, just like agriculture, lawns and gardens, you know, a lot of, um, um, a lot of fertilizer applied to those golf, golf courses and then ultimately sewage. And by sewage, it doesn't necessarily just like raw sewage, like if you've got, um, say, a sewage treatment plant, um, you know, that's collecting sewage from a whole city and then being dumped straight into the lake. Sewage, <clears throat> excuse me, can also leach into the lake through the groundwater. And, um, and a lot of that would be through um, non-compliant septic systems. And with the soils that we have around the lake, um, you have to be very, very careful with how those septic systems are constructed in order to not um, add a lot of nutrients to the lake. Uh, something I forgot to mention here uh, when I started, and I really wanted to, is if I'm, you know, kind of um, blasting through a concept I'm trying to create or I'm trying to present, and you're not um, understanding exactly what I'm talking about, feel free to let me know. You know, um, I like to work best kind of in a back and forth um, manner. So if you, if one of you guys doesn't understand the concept I'm trying to present, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's somebody else that also doesn't understand it. So just feel free to jump in. So what did Mille Lacs look like uh, before European American settlement uh, occurred here? Um, my understanding is, you know, and this is through some of the oral records that I've, you know, that I've, you know, um, been exposed to is that the water on Mille Lacs was actually fairly clear. Um, once the settlement era started, you know, we had some forests cut, we had a little bit of agriculture come into the, um, come into the area, but the big one was that the population of the area just increased. So we had some communities spring up around the lake and they were probably larger than Native American communities that had existed here before. And then of course, lots and lots and lots of cabins, you know, there's, there's cabins, you know, pretty much circling the lake right now. Ultimately what happened is the water became less clear and, um, and um, people started seeing algae blooms. Um, 
during the early or well, there was a whole series of environmental laws that were passed starting in the 1940s, but uh, a lot of those environmental laws just didn't have any teeth. Um, one of the big ones that that got passed or probably the biggest and most significant one that was going to impact water quality around the nation was something called the Clean Water Act that was passed in 1972. And there was a couple of really important things with the Clean Water Act. And the first thing is that it addressed point sources of pollution. So that's um, things like, in, you know, in the case of municipal sewage, you know, would be like um, a municipal sewage treatment plant that was just dumping into the lake. And uh, so it could address those and it could also set water quality standards. It didn't really um, have an impact. My understanding is it didn't really have an impact on, on things like septic systems. Septic systems were, um, they're, they're considered a non-point so, non source um, pollution source. And um, and septic system changes were addressed through county ordinances. And so the county ordinances are typically that when you sell your property, these um, the new owners have to be in possession of a um, of a septic of a septic system that meets code. And so as the properties turned over through time, um, sep um, septic systems basically got uh, improved so that they were contributing um, um, fewer nutrients to the lake. And ultimately, the result of that was that, uh, you know, Mille Lacs, um, you know, just just talking to some of the people that lived here, um, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, they talk about, you know, driving a boat through Mille Lacs and you, could, you would actually end up leaving a trail in the algae blooms. And those pretty much came to an end um, when the lake flipped to a clear state in 1995. And when we talk about flip, that's literally what happens is over a very, very short period of time, um, with the reduction in nutrients going into that lake, that um, um, the lake just became clear virtually, you know, in one year. And the way we measure that is through something called a Secchi disk. It's an extremely simple device. It's, um, what is it? I think it's like um, eight inches in diameter. It's a black and white disk. And the way that we use this thing to measure water clarity is we simply drop it down until you can't see it. And then you raise it up until you can just barely see it again. And then halfway between those two values is uh, what we call the Secchi depth. And what we can see is that the Secchi depth, you know, um, up until about 1995, it had been bouncing along at about uh, 2.8 meters, which is just a little bit less than three feet. And after 1995, the average Secchi depth has been something closer to like four meters, which is right around 12 feet. You can see it bounces around from year to year. These are like summer long averages, you know, that I'm presenting here. It bounces around a little bit from year to year, you know, but overall you can see that the, so that, that horizontal line uh, that I've got in that particular figure is the um, average Secchi depth um, before 1995. And you can see that it's, it's, uh, it's only actually hit that um, in the modern era of Secchi depth like once, and that happened to be in like 2010 or 2011 or something like that. You see, basically what happens is our lake is much, much clearer now than it was prior to 1995. So how does the second depth that we have now, how does that, how does that relate to what, um, what was here historically? You know, we've only got really good second depth records going back into about the 1970s. So we don't really, you know, we don't have any way of um, really gauging, well, what was the lake like? back, you know, before European American settlement. And, um, and luckily for us, there, there's a tool that we can use. And um, this picture that I'm showing you is of a type of algae called diatoms. And uh, diatoms have a, a fairly unique characteristic in that they've got shells that are made of silica, you know, which is essentially glass. And um, the various species of diatoms uh, can be identified through the shells that they have. And what's interesting about diatoms is that some of these diatoms do very, very well in uh, in productive waters, and some of the others do do well in relatively unproductive waters. And so when you can uh, look at what the species mixes were um, through history, uh, you can you get some some idea of how productive a water body was um, at various points in time. And the way that was done. Um, there was there was a study done in oh geez when was it I think it was done in the early 2000s like 2001 2002 something like that 
Um, the way that was study was done was um, there was a university researcher, I believe it was, and he went out and he took sediment cores on the lake. And so all a sediment core is, is you drop, um, I mean, simply, simply, you just drop a tube down and you take a core of the bottom sample. And uh, by looking at the various layers, you can actually tell when each of these um, layers in the bottom was laid down. I'm not sure if they do some carbon dating in there or not, but anyways, it's it's a technique that's kind of beyond me. But you know, anyways, it's it's an interesting technique. I can't explain it to the finest um, detail. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, a few screens back, you were talking about the clear water. You thought it was like Superior versus another lake or cornfield was thriving or not due to nutrients. Yes. Um, on your graph there that you just showed a few back. I'm sorry, this might be a stupid question. Where is the fine line between too clean where it's not getting the nutrients? Because you were saying the one lake was too clean and it wasn't getting the proper nutrients that it needs. I guess on this scale, where is, what's the target that, you know, we're going after? Because I mean, they, knew, they yep. need nutrients to yep. survive, but. Yep, that, that's actually an excellent question. Okay. Um, and, it, and it really, it depends on what you want to use this, this, this water for. Um, you know, Malax is more than just the walleye. Fa I mean, Malax is a walleye factory. It always has been. But there's there's so many other uses for Malax. And, you know, among those uses is just people swimming, people boating. Um, um, I don't know, paddling your canoe, whatever, you know, there, there's other uses for that water body. And generally, people like to do those types of things in very clear water. You know, the misconception is that the clear water, you know, is 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 really good water, and it's uh, it's just better for the fish. Well, it can produce less fish. So, the question is, um, what what is too clean? And I guess at, at the at the point where it's not doing what you want, what what. Um, do I want to say this? When when it's no longer providing for the types of uses that people want out of that lake, I guess at that point you could call it too clean. Um, I I like to think that if it's back to kind of a more natural state, that's where we should be at. I don't think of it as being necessarily too clean. I think of it as being overly productive. Because you can go in um, into an overly productive state as well, and walleye kind of do well in the middle. You know, I mean, we're kind of focused on walleye here, right? So walleye are kind of they they do well kind of in that middle range of productivity. If it's uh, if the water is very unproductive, you get very few walleye. If the water is extremely productive, you can start getting more things like carp and bass. You know, walleye don't don't do very well in those types of conditions either. Um, a really good case study on that on that is uh, is Lake Erie. So Lake Erie was very very heavily uh, polluted with uh, nutrients, and in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, Lake Erie was essentially a dead lake, and it was through some very very strict um, laws that were passed that uh, that ultimately got Lake Erie cleaned up, and it's um, you know it's producing walleye again today. Now it's had some other things happen to it in the, you know, uh, just like Mille Lacs, it's had some invasive species come into it. Um, and that's caused, you know, some problems on Lake Erie, but, um, but I mean, does that kind of answer your question? Yes, it does, sorry. I took a bite of food, of course, right when you asked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So Tom, it looks like Steve has his hand up too. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, just thinking if I can add to this and hopefully not confuse it more. Um, the um, cycling that, that you see in this particular gra graph, it's fairly typical of um, almost all lakes. Uh, in, in Mille Lacs, when we think about the in, in entire food chain, in particular, Tulabi, uh, very sensitive species, and they're going to do best in what we would refer to as um, 
uh, say, mesotrophic to oligotrophic, that moderately to very low productivity. Um, and without tulipy, you don't have the um, walleye population that we've come to know, the quality of, of the walleye and such. So as you've said, Tom, there's many, many things go, uh, go into this. Um, slight changes can you know, shift you from having the, the severe harmful algal blooms, which you mentioned Lake Erie in the last um, perhaps 10 years, they've had extreme problems with it. Well, we need to remember Lake Erie is also a drinking water source. And um, it, people, you know, boating, swimming, recreating on it, and it's, um, drew a lot of national attention. Um, Mille Lacs water quality is, is good. It's, I think it's, um, you know, close to where you'd like it, but there has been some, some distinct changes. And I, I think you're leading up to this with with the zebra mussels and the very uh, distinct impact they've had on productivity. Great. Yeah, I, I, uh, Steve, just just for Melissa, I think she was not able to make it to our original meeting. Could you give her your background real quick? Um, before I was retired and bumming around in places like Arizona and Texas, I worked at the Pollution Control Agency for 38 years. Uh, much of that was studying lakes across Minnesota and developing water quality standards to protect the condition of the lakes. And as a part of that work, we did um, a real extensive study of the water quality of, of Mille Lacs, as well as um, assessing trends um, graph like this would have been typical of something I had um, produced for um, uh, Melissa when I was asked to look at uh, trends in transparency and productivity at the lake. Cool. Is that squaring away, Melissa? Yeah, definitely. So. Yeah. I'm kind of curious though, in how the comparison between how like Red Lake bounced back to, you know, what can, you know, what we learned from that to maybe help Mille Lacs be, you know, more sustainable as well. Sure. You know, I mean, talk, talking about Red Lake is a little bit, you know, beyond what I want to get into here. Okay. But, the, but the the issue with Red Lake was never one of a productivity change. The issue with Red Lake was was an over harvest situation. Yes, yes, definitely. And um, and and so what? Uh, Red Lake was shut down for what? I don't know, five, six, seven years, something like that. Yeah. And during that era, um, the walleye population. You know, the Red Lake always had a walleye population. They, they never completely went away. No. But, but uh, the expert opinion was that uh, it would take an extremely long time for that walleye population to recover naturally. Mm -hmm. So what was done was um, there was a tremendous number of walleye fry, <coughs> excuse me, stocked into Red Lake to kind of get the thing jump started again. And um, so those fry were stocked in there in essentially in you know in a virgin system. There was very little competition amongst other things. There was a lot of food resources available for available for them. And they really took off. And so um, walleye fry were stocked every other year for um, um, over a six year period. So there were three separate stockings. And, um, you know, and, and that lake recovered very, very quickly because of that. Mille Lacs is a very different situation. So I don't believe Mille Lacs was ever over harvested to the point where, you know, the walleye population couldn't sustain itself. 
uh, what's going on with Mille Lacs is that there's been some productivity changes, you know, and, and I'll and I'll talk more about this later in the talk, but there's been some productivity changes um, that just don't allow the lake to support as many walleye as it as it has in the past. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thank Tom. Looks like awesome. Larry has his hand raised as well. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Larry. Okay, Tom. My question is, as the water became cleaner, it cleared up on, on Mille Lacs, and and that's uh, was did not help the productivity. But can you not have clean water and still not? Can it be stained and still be? Uh, clean water and it still be productive. Yeah, the so um, you know a good example of that is is Lake of the Woods. Lake of the Woods right. is um, at least the Minnesota portion is a very stained lake. Correct. And uh, what causes that staining is um, basically it's bog runoff. You know, and if you've ever driven up to Bedette, you know, to go fishing on Lake of the Woods, you're driving through miles and miles and miles of bog. Well, once you get north of um, Oh, what is it? Uh, the state park up there. Once you get north of uh, Big Bog State Park, um, a lot of that bog runoff goes north up into the Lake of the Woods area, and bog runoff uh, is not only stained, you know, and so it um, it has less clarity. Bog runoff also tends to be very high in phosphorus, and so Lake of the Woods is is a very productive lake. It's a big shallow lake, just like uh, just like Mille Lacs is, and um, and 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 Lake of the Woods does get some hellacious blue-green algae blooms, you know, uh, just like Mille Lacs used to. Now, the difference is that on Lake of the Woods, um, they've also done some core samples there. And what they found is that um, a, a lot of the phosphorus, not all of it, but certainly a, a big chunk of it, is from natural sources on Lake of the Woods. As opposed to Mille Lacs, um, the, um, the increased levels of phosphorus that we saw after um, you know, and I'll get into this with the next series of slides. But uh, after European American settlement in the area, the increased um, amount of phosphorus going into the lake was due to man-made causes. And so then, as those man-made causes got cleaned up, Mille Lacs basically reverted to a to a past state. So, in order to make Mille Lacs more productive, we need more phosphorus into it, and around the Mille Lacs area because of the way the soil and that is, we really don't have any way of doing it without artificially adding phosphorus from, from the lawns right. and all this that you're talking about. Right. Okay. And, and I mean, and that's, I mean, I know there are some lakes where people do add phosphorus, you know, typically it happens out in the mountains. I wouldn't necessarily be for that. Um, it'd be very difficult to predict exactly how that's going to impact things, especially now that zebra mussels are in the lake. We might end up with twice as many zebra mussels and just as many walleye, you know. So it's it's something you really can't predict. Okay, thank you. Yep. Looks like Steve raised his hand on that one too. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Okay, not hearing you, Steve. You might be muted. Can you hear us, Steve? We check your mute. Okay. If your mute's not working, you could uh, send something in the chat. And I can help you out with that, but you can go ahead, Tom. Okay, well, let's move on a little bit. So anyways, this is a picture of a bunch of diatoms. And, and like I said, each one of these um, has really a preferred level of productivity that they do best in. And so by looking at the ratio or the mix of the different species at different points in time, we can get an understanding of um, how productive the lake was, or in particular, how much, pro uh, how much phosphorus was going into the water body at any particular time. Again, this is just a picture of a core sample. So these shells persist, you know, once the, uh, once the algae dies, diatoms are a type of algae. Once they die, they settle down to the bottom. And, um, and so those shells are actually preserved in the sediments on the bottom. And so that's what these guys were looking at. They're looking at doing a core sample. 
uh, they start to slice that core, they can age when that, um, that particular layer of sediment was laid down. And so then they can go back in time and uh, have an understanding of uh, how productive the lake was at any particular point in time. And so this was the, um, th these are the graphs that they produced. So on the left side here, so all of these, you know, um, are different species of diatoms. Um, I don't really know that much about diatoms, you know, so, you know, I can't really interpret this stuff to you. But um, what we've got is we've got benthic diatoms. So these are diatoms that live on the bottom. So remember that these things are algae, they require light in order, in order to grow. And then we've got these planktonic diatoms over here. And um, these, these um, line graphs down below, right in this area here, what that shows is the, is the abundance of these, of these two groups. So benthic diatoms tend to do very well when uh, water is relatively clear because then light can get all the way to the bottom of the lake and then these things can, can grow. Planktonic diatoms start to take off as you get more phosphorus in the water. And, um, and as planktonic diatoms take off, what happens is they tend to shade out the benthic diatoms. So the benthic diatoms don't do very well as planktonic diatoms take off. And so what you can infer from that then is uh, what were the phosphorus levels at various points in time? And so point zero is right around 2002. And the highest phosphorus levels, you know, if you start going back in time, if you think, okay, about 2000, uh, the very highest phosphorus levels were like 25, uh, let's see, there's probably 25 years ago right here. And so this is maybe 30, 40 years ago. So this is probably the mid to late 60s, maybe the early 70s. Uh, that's when our highest phosphorus levels were. As that uh, clean water legislation started coming online, you could see what happened is our phosphorus levels went down. I don't know why this bump occurred here. You know, they didn't really talk about that in their paper. But, uh, but what you can see is that there was this very long period of increasing phosphorus levels starting about 100 years before the core was taken in 2002. So that was right around 1900. And so then you could see this period here where phosphorus levels were actually relatively stable prior to when, when people started settling around Mille Lacs Lake, which was right around 1900. And uh, so that, and, and if you look, so it increased, let's see, it increased, it, it went down, we had this little bump for whatever reason, but then it uh, declined again shortly after that. And uh, what you can see here is that currently, or at, at least as of 2002, phosphorus levels are pretty much at about the same point that they were prior to European American settlement. So that's some pretty good evidence that right now the lake is probably at about historical productivity levels. Anybody have any questions about this one? It's got a lot of information on this on this particular slide. Okay, we good? Looks like Larry has his hand up. Oh, go ahead, Larry. Understand this correctly then, as the phosphorus level dropped, then it allowed for the uh, the grass and, and also the uh, algae to grow on the bottom of the lake more. Is that is that correct? Right, that, that, typically, that would typically happen. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. So algae and things like that growing on the bottom of the lake, you know, they also require phosphorus, you know, they're plant. Okay. Uh, what these graphs show is, is only diatoms, which is a very particular type of algae. There's no, you know, um, and, and the reason that these are used, it's because the shells that um, um, surround these diatoms or that they live in are very, very persistent. And so we can, we can kind of infer what various phosphorus levels were through time based on, on the species mix of those particular animals or plants. What, 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 I'm, what I've seen last year and, and, and seen more of is in some areas where there wasn't uh, grass growing on the bottom, there is now in areas like in the garrison area, there's almost a, uh, there was some heavy algae right on the bottom, almost like a, a, a green slime last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is that is that be the cause then? Because is that part of the uh, the benthic? It, yeah, it it's possible, but um, but you know re remember that last year you know we had a drought and the lake level was relatively low and relatively warm, and okay. so that would also have an impact on um, on that type of stuff growing. 
Okay. And certainly the clearer water would allow uh, plants that grow on the bottom to grow to a deeper level than they had historically. Or, okay. or like within people's memories, you know, I shouldn't say historically. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Anybody Looks else? Like Steve has his hand raised. Yep, go ahead, Steve. Yep. Um, yeah, following up on that observation, the previous one uh, on the idea of adding phosphorus to the lake. Um, this is one thing we don't, we wouldn't know for sure, but I think given the zebra mussels, additional phosphorus would likely promote more of um, the benthic algae, the, uh, the attached algae, um, things you might, Think of as uh, slime or moss on the bottom. Um, those bottom, the bottom sediments become enriched, and part of this, a lot of this, would have to do with the processing of the, of the zebra mussels. So my guess is that this having some additional phosphorus in the lake would likely not um improve the productivity of the lake in the fashion we would want it to right plus it would uh, lead to more oxygen demand and that oxygen demand is one of the uh limiters of the tulipy knowing they need high oxygen and cool water um Yep. But that, that'd be my my take on that. Right. Yeah, and those are some really good points, Steve. Okay. So in essence, what I what I'm trying to get across here is that you know the Malax that we have today is probably very, very similar to the Malax that existed before European American settlement, you know, took place in terms of productivity on, on the water. <clears throat> so what else has changed? So in 1995, we had the lake suddenly flipped to a more clear state. Um, in 2006, the lake was invaded by zebra mussels. And in 2009, the lake was invaded by something called spiny water fleas. So neither one of these is going to change productivity, you know, overall. And recall that, you know, when I, when I talk about productivity, it's the amount of stuff that's alive and growing in the water, the amount of um, organic material that's being added to the, to the water every year. Uh, Zebes and spiny water fleas don't change that, but what they do is they tend to change energy pathways and, and energy in the terms that I'm talking about it right now is food. So zebra mussels are a filter feeder and like, like Steve pointed out, what happens is that these things filter, uh, they're, what, they're, what they're trying to eat is, uh, is planktonic um, algae, so call that phytoplankton, just means plants that are drifting around in the water column. That's what their primary food source is. So they filter that stuff out, they take it in, and they convert that particular food source into a zebra mussel. Um, spiny water fleas, what they do is they eat uh, zooplankton. So that's the, you know, the little animals, the little tiny animals that are maybe a millimeter and less long, drifting around in the water column. And those animals happen to be the primary food source for small fish, minnows, Young of the, um, you know, during their first few weeks of life, um, walleye depend on uh, on zooplankton, perch, and then minnows, you know, are are eating that kind of stuff. And of course, then they're, you know, in turn consumed by walleye. And as you get fewer and fewer of those zooplankton out there, um, and and then the zooplankton population goes down for a couple of reasons. You know, one is that uh, zebra mussels are are taking you know the the food for zooplankton that planktonic algae out and converting it into zebra mussel biomass, and then all of a sudden you get these uh, spiny water fleas coming along and eating the the zooplankton, and all of a sudden your whole food chain is is shifted. So what zebra mussels in particular do is they they take a planktonic food web, you know, food web that's based on stuff drifting around through the water column and converting it to a benthic food web because they're living on the bottom. And not only do they live on the bottom, but they die on the bottom and that's where they decompose. And so all that energy that they have taken out of the water column 
suddenly gets converted to the energy that's laying on the bottom of the lake. And so zebra mussel abundance has changed through time. And um, uh, probably they invaded in about 2005, but uh, they, weren't, they weren't found until 2006. And so these numbers, this is the number. Um, so right after they came on, on, on um, into the lake, um, there was a couple of guys that started diving on areas where you would expect zebra mussels to thrive, and that tends to be rock. They, uh, zebra mussels need a hard substrate in order to grow. And so what they did is they started monitoring the abundance of zebra mussels on these, on these rock piles. And you can see they just kind of bounced along for, I don't know, was that like five, maybe five years, four or five years? <coughs> Excuse me. And all of a sudden in 2011, they exploded. And so in the areas that they had colonized and that we were sampling, um, in 2011, they went from like 13.9 per square foot to 921. Uh, they peaked in 2012 at 12 or over 1,200 per square foot. And at that point, they started coming down in abundance again. Um, I don't know why there was no survey in 2016. In 2020, we weren't allowed to survey because of COVID issues. But what you can see is that currently our zebra mussel population is, oh, maybe a third, you know, to maybe a half of, of what it was at its peak. And so we're in a better place, but, um, but keep in mind that each one of these zebra mussels can filter like one liter of water per day. That's like a quart. And, um, and if you think about 361 of these things still existing per square foot, that's 361 liters of water for every square foot that these things have colonized uh, that are being filtered. And so you're still looking at, uh, you know, at a fairly significant impact on that uh, planktonic food chain um, just because of zebra mussel abundance. Uh, zooplankton changes um, have also occurred. Uh, so recall that, um, oh, what was it, 2009, spiny water fleas invaded. Um, we also had spiny water fleas invade on Lake of the Woods, and um, we had kind of a long-term zooplankton monitoring program up there. And what was interesting was that even though we had been sampling spiny water fleas, we didn't really see an impact to the zooplankton community until about three years after they invaded. And so they probably went through the same kind of uh, population expansion that the zebra mussels do. That's a very common way that invading species, um, their populations change through time as they invade a new area. Um, they, you know, they come into the area, they bounce along at a fairly low level, and all of a sudden they explode, and then they come down to some more manageable level through time. But what's really interesting here is that um, as, you know, you, you can kind of follow these trends. The, the graph on the left is, is um, zooplankton density, so that's the number of individuals. The graph on the right is biomass, so that's the weight of all those individuals. And it's the number of uh, micrograms per liter of water, which is, I don't know, it's a pretty small, pretty small number. But, um, but what you can see is that, uh, so zebra mussels came into the system in 2006, and then they peaked in 2012. And what you would expect zebra mussels to do is just kind of overall lower abundance of, of uh, the zooplankton community because they're take, basically what they're doing is they're taking away the food that these zooplankton depend on. So what you would see is the overall abundance would go down, but you wouldn't really see a change necessarily in the species mix. What caused the change in the species mix then is when spiny water fleas came up. And so that's this black line on the right here. You can see that um, they invaded in 2009 and they started, you know, their population started growing. And so spiny water fleas in particular are pretty voracious predators on uh, a group of um, zooplankton called small cladocerans. So that's, uh, you know, I always describe cladocerans as the big, fat, dumb, happy cows out there in the zooplankton world. They are, you know, a food source for an awful lot of, uh, you know, larger zooplankton as well as fish. And what you can see is that... Uh, as spiny water fleas came into the system, that these small cladocerans, so that's these uh, the blue parts of these bars, they really dropped down to almost non-existent levels. And this is very common. We saw exactly the same thing happen on Lake of the Woods. Um, and, um, you know, probably, you know, here, you know, with, with these very low levels of abundance here, that was probably a combination of uh, spiny water fleas as well as uh, zebra mussels. 
Um, and then as the, you know, zebra mussel population started to decline to more manageable levels, we saw some, some moderate recovery in the zooplankton population, but still nowhere near what it was before, uh, uh, before uh, zebra mussels as well as spiny water fleas um, came into the system. You know, right now, look at it's like maybe one fourth, maybe a little bit more than one fourth of, um, of their abundance of pre-invasion. And so, you know, kind of keep this kind of stuff in mind because this is the base of the, not the base of the food chain, but it's that, that part of the food chain that converts vegetable matter to animal matter that the fish that we care about um, rely on. And so if we start to look at this in terms of uh, how have walleye, you know, how has walleye biomass changed on the lake? Um, I, we, do, we do some modeling on the lake, so we've got an idea of, um, of how many pounds of 14 inch plus walleye there are out there. And so this box here, this yellow box, what that does is it encompasses the period from the time that the lake cleared up in 1995 until um, uh, zebra mussels peaked in uh, in 2012. And what you could see is that there's actually, you know, a, pr a pretty stable, a pretty steady decline in overall abundance of walleye biomass. Um, and, and we really can't attribute that to, uh, you know, increased harvest levels because, you know, certainly in this area here, this is where we had some, uh, started enacting some fairly strict harvest regulations on the walleye population. Despite that, they continue to go down. But um, you can see, so this is an impact of probably a very strong year class produced in 2013 or 20, yeah, 2013. And so as those fish started to pass from the population started going down again. Um, but anyways, you know, the, the story here is that, um, you know, there's just fewer walleye out there that are available for anglers to catch now. Um, and, um, you know, and that's largely due to changes from within the lake. It's got nothing to do with over harvest or anything like that. Uh, looking at this a slightly different way, uh, what we do is we um, we can we we we, we talk about walleye year class strength, and so the strength uh, you know a strong year class is is one where uh, we just produced an awful lot of walleye in one particular year. So you guys that have been fishing the lake for a while, you know that uh, oh especially in recent era, 2002 was a very very strong walleye year class, and then more recently we had the 2013 year class that was probably the third strongest that we've ever measured on the lake. And then the 2017 year class came along and that's a pretty decent year class. But if we average these year class strengths across eras, what we could see is that after 1995 um, year class strength, average year class strength took a dip. And then once zebra mussels came into the lake in, uh, in 2006, there was a really big dip in the average year class strength through that time period. And, um, and, I, and I think that just speaks to how you know, the lake has actually changed. So these would be fish that really aren't impacted by angling at all. These are, um, uh, we gauge year class strength based on um, the number of fish that we catch in our fall gill nets um, from age one to age three. And um, so that's before they really enter the fishery. So, um, so year class strength has been declining pretty steadily for, you know, since 1995. And uh, so I guess the message I want to leave you guys with today is that Mille Lacs Lake today is not the Mille Lacs Lake of the 70s through the early 90s. You know, that's what people kind of think of as the glory years. I think there was a couple of years in the early 90s where we harvested like a million pounds of walleye. Um, but, uh, but today, the, the Mille Lacs Lake that we have to deal with today is much more like the pre-settlement Mille Lacs Lake. With that, if you guys have any questions or want to talk about anything in particular, um, I'd be happy to address them now. Oops. Myself here. Any questions, thoughts? Go ahead, Larry. Question, question, just what it, it looks like is, I can understand of the food source is down and it's just not as productive. Is there anything that is possible for us to do to uh, actually improve the walleyes on this lake, the numbers? Tom, is there anything that we can do other than just sit back and try to monitor, monitor what we get? Uh, meaning that, can we bring the production up on, on the walleyes? Is there 
is, is that possible even? Probably not. You know, basically what we have to do is learn to adjust our expectations on what we can expect out of this walleye population. Uh, one, one of the things that I'll, um, I don't know if, I think I'm gonna cover it in a future talk, but it's um, how the various fish populations changed and the two really Im important ones. Well, there's three, I guess, or four. Um, I can talk about walleye, tulipy, perch, and, um, and smallmouth bass. And, you know, through this whole period of declining productivity, walleye have gone down, perch have gone down. Um, tulabies, there may be more going on than just productivity there. There may be some water temperature issues, but smallmouth bass have taken off. And, um, and if you recall, you know, when I talked about how zebra mussels convert, you know, um, a food web that's based in plankton to a food web that's based on the bottom, so the benthic base, uh, the benthic food web. Um, smallmouth bass are much more reliant on that benthic food web. They eat a lot more insects, they eat crayfish. You know, they certainly eat fish, you know, just like walleye eat a few crayfish, but the bulk of their diet is really based on that benthic food web. And so, Smallmouth uh, uh, zebra mussels in particular have been described as um, um, environmental engineers where there's basically change how things work in the environment. And um, I just don't think that there's any really good solutions to actually producing more walleye at this point. Okay, it, it may not be fair, but I'm sure you're well aware of it. The amount of heat that anybody that works with the DNR <laughs> uh, takes for a would have even done in 20 years that walleyes are getting less and less and and really what what i'm hearing then is is that it isn't something that you're not doing it's something the way the lake changed that it's really not possible for you or any other group to come in there and do something that's going to improve the the number of walleyes in in Mille Lacs lake we have to deal with what we what we have is that is that accurate that, that's pretty accurate. Now, as far as, you know, the number of walleye continuing to go down, um, there, I'm st I, I think I'm starting to see some signs that that population may have stabilized, you know, at the okay. level that it's at right now. And I think one of the, um, one of the big signs that I'm looking at, you know, and, and it's early because it's only one year class, but it seems like we got a really good year class of perch produced in 2020. And so I think one of the things that's happened is that perch haven't been very successful in producing a year class. Um, they, they tend to have a, a shorter life cycle than walleye. And so walleye can be a very long lived fish. You know, they can easily get to be over 20 years old. And so as some of these productivity changes occurred in the lake, um, you know, we've been protecting walleye, trying to keep them from going down. Right. Well, all of a sudden you've got an awful lot of walleye, probably more than what the lake would normally be able to sustain, and they're just pounding the heck out of that perch population. And with the uh, with the production of that perch population or or that one perch year class right now, I think that's a good sign that maybe our lake is stabilized. You know, with the current walleye population that we have right now. Okay, but the chances of going getting back into a it was in the '90s probably is it, it, like you said is not going to happen again because the later lake cannot sustain that right. amount of fish anymore yes so, so it might go up some because of the food amount of food and that but yep as far as going back the way it was that's part of the past yes and and what you want to keep in mind too is that 90s was probably artificially high just because of effluence going into the lake you know sure. if you go back into the you know way back in back into the day you know, this is probably the the you know the lake that uh, that people first found when they when they moved to the area. Okay. All right. Thanks, Tom. Yep. yep. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, I think uh, um, Larry Larry's questions and in your response is pretty well well addressed. I suspect in you've probably got a graphic that uh, shows smallmouth over time, the population as, as compared to walleye. I think that'd be quite telling in, in um, 
And they're, yeah, it's all about this, this larger productivity picture. If you've got other predator fish, predator fish that where there's um, substantial numbers, substantial biomass competing with the walleye, um, that, as you say, it's just going to limit what, what the potentials are. Um, the ch challenge will be um, com communicating that, and then um, I'm guessing you're going to address it in, 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 in your future talks here, but setting some realistic goals and um, being... I guess being willing to allow the anglers to, to, to take, take some walleye. Right. And just uh, assume knowing, not even assuming, knowing that, you know, we'll never reach, reach those highs again. The populations are going to bounce around within, you know, the certain, certain bounds. And that's what we have to live with and you know you know maybe the again the challenge will be getting everyone that's making the important decisions to agree on that and just the willingness to be able to to harvest harvest some of the fish right yeah i mean and that's a good point you know and i, th I think you kind of touched on a little bit there steve is that you know, when I talk about a stable population, I'm just talking about a population that isn't changing over the long haul. There's always going to be years when we've had, you know, like a really strong year class and we'll have some really good fishing. And there's going to be some years where we have a couple of weak year classes in a row and, you know, and the population is going to go down. It's going to fluctuate within some some boundaries. And um, and I think that's what we're going to you know, be looking at and expecting, you know, as we go down the road here. Tom, uh, again, what I'm what I'm hearing then, although the the walleye population and and that is maybe stabilizing now, where we have a chance of improving, what is improving is the smallmouth bass productivity, mm -hmm. and there I, maybe we should be then looking to uh, concentrate on more. The walleyes may be stabilized, but smallmouth bass. And their legs got a potential for increasing. And, you know, is that where we need to need to try to move some of the focus into or to uh, away from the walleyes and uh, be looking at more what we can do for smallmouth bass to improve to improve the uh, the fishery itself. Um, I'm trying to remember if I've got this in some of my talks. I, you know, I didn't think about it at the time that I was putting these talks together, but I can um, I can put another talk together if people want to see it for like a you know get together for a fifth period, um, just to take a look and see how some of our fish populations have changed through time. So one of the one of the issues that um, we have to deal with, um, you know, particularly with smallmouth bass anglers, the real hardcore smallmouth anglers. They want to see, um, you know, less harvest on smallmouth bass, and they want to see um, like larger sizes of fish because, you know, people generally don't like to eat smallies, but they have um, they attach a very high value to a large smallmouth bass. So through the creel survey, you know, what we see is that of the of the bass that are legal to harvest, so those fish that are shorter than 17 inches about 98% of those things are being thrown back voluntarily. So people could harvest them, but they're throwing them back. Um, the, the other thing that, um, that I've seen, and this is through aging smallmouth bass, is that on average, smallmouth bass just, you know, in Mille Lacs Lake, they can get large, you know, a 20 inch smallmouth is a pretty substantial smallmouth, but it's a very unusual fish that can actually get quite a bit larger than that. On average, they just don't have the ability to get you know, 24, 25 inches, say, you know, that would be an extremely rare and unusual fish that can do that. So, you know, talking about improving the smallmouth bass, you know, um, population in terms of either abundance or its size structure, 
you know, by you know, the the only tool we really have available is to you know limit harvest or somehow restrict it to harvesting certain sizes of fish, and and with harvest being uh, as low as it is on that population, I mean we could probably shut down the harvest completely on smallmouth bass and really not have an awful lot of an impact on that population, either the size structure or the abundance. Okay, thanks, Tom. Appreciate yep. it. Yep, go ahead, Steve. <laughs> yeah, as soon as we get on smallmouth bass, we keep. <laughs> um, as you know, as, as you've said before, you know, when we look at productivity and size classes and, and, and all that, um, smallmouth bass anglers. The ones wanting larger size, the way you get larger size is by starting to reduce some of the smaller sized fish. Again, even for the smallmouth, there's only so much food out there. Um, you, you're probably not going to convince the hardcore smallmouth angler to start taking some fish but um getting getting the idea across to the public that hey it's okay to do this and it's not um hurting what they're after you just cannot you can't have tons of small fish and expect them that you're going to produce a lot of large fish right yeah there there are biological so you know. there's limits and you know i i would think they'd they'd appreciate or understand that but I, that i don't that i don't know if if the idea if they're the thinking is that you got all these small fish and they're all going to progress into these um larger real desirable um sizes you know for the, the the catch catch and release well that's just just not true you know you look look at dnr's management for you know be it sunfish crappies and on and on um you dominate with small fish you're you're going to limit the abundance of larger fish but that's perhaps neither here nor there right now yeah So there, so there does seem to be some interest in, um, you know, in how our fish populations have changed through time. And so what I can do is, um, so I've got one particular talk set up that's just based, that just talks about our sampling methods. And I'll make sure that I, um, that I incorporate some of that stuff, you know, population changes into that, into that talk. I'll bulk it up a little. Anybody else? Anybody have any thoughts or comments? Okay, so uh, next week um, I won't be here. Um, Missy Tremel is going to um, cover the talk next week. So she's the research supervisor for uh, DNR Fisheries. And what Missy is going to be talking about is uh, treaty issues. Um, you know, kind of um, set the sideboards, you know, the, the legal sideboards, you know, as well as our, our cooperative sideboards um, with how we manage the lake um, with tribal input. And uh, so that's going to be the focus of her talk next week. So hopefully you can all make that one because I, I think it's, um, it's it's pretty interesting stuff. Anybody else? Sunday evenings working for you guys. Obviously, it works for you guys because you showed up. But uh, are there any issues? I think so. Nah, it's probably work. as good as anything. Okay. Cool. Okay. So. Um, with that, then I guess um, hopefully you guys got something out of this, and um, I guess we can we can stop recording and.
Yeah. If anyone has any done. additional questions you think about after this too, feel free to email Tom or email Malax Fisheries email and we can get back to you. No, I just want to thank all of you guys. It was very informative and um, great information. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yep. All right, I will be back next Sunday. So remember how to mute and unmute your mics and raise your hands. <laughs> okay. We'll see you all then. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks. <laughs>